from WSL Pure, this is One Ocean. Hey everyone, Reese here and welcome to another show. I hope this finds you healthy and safe wherever you're listening. And I know I've been saying that a lot lately, but that's because I truly, truly mean it. I do hope that you and yours are healthy and safe amidst everything that's going on. And I want to express that emotion and that caring. And it's funny that suddenly we're all expressing care for one another as we start meetings and conference calls. It's checking in and, and you know, how are you doing? And yeah, we used to say a perfunctory sort of how are you doing, but generally our pre-COVID-19 world was so busy. We hopped straight into it. I mean, I'm guilty of it. I lived in New York City for 10 years, you know. We always used to just, hey, hey, how you doing? Okay, cool, let's get right down to business. And so I was thinking, if only there were a faster way to express all that meaning, that that love. And then I started working on this episode with Kona Johnson, who grew up on the North Shore of Oahu, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Aloha. Taurus know it as the famous Hawaiian greeting. Some may even take the aloha spirit with them when they leave, and they may have a sense that there's a deeper meaning, but it really is apt in times of COVID-19. From Wikipedia, aloha is the Hawaiian word for love, affection, peace, compassion, and mercy, and it's commonly used as a simple greeting but has a deeper cultural and spiritual significance to native Hawaiians in which the term is used to define a force that holds together existence. I'm going to say that again, a force that holds together existence. That sounds like exactly what we all need right now. So with utmost respect and admiration and a total sensitivity to not encourage cultural appropriation, aloha. Appropriately, we have Kona Johnson with us today, and he embodies the aloha spirit. Uh, Kona is a surfer, a writer, a traveler, an environmentalist, an activist, and as of recently, an open ocean sailor. Having sailed from Hawaii to the Palmyra Atoll with his buddies John John Florence, Nathan Florence, and Eric Knudsen. And they had an incredible experience, and in this conversation, we dig into the story behind their trip, their experience hanging with the Nature Conservancy on the Palmyra Atoll, and how the ecosystem there is rebuilding itself in the middle of the ocean. And we say rebuilding because while it's a remote place and it is beautiful, the Palmyra Atoll used to be a U.S. military outpost. And let's just say that at the time that the military was there, conservation wasn't their mission. So let's see what it was like to sail out to the Palmyra Atoll with Kona Johnson. Kona, great to have you here with us. Thanks Thanks for making time. Thanks for stopping by in L.A. And um Right off the bat, like I could kind of ID you uh, with a number of titles or whatever and things you've done, but you know, who are you? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> deep. We got deep right we off the bat. We go deep quickly. <laughs> um, I'd call myself Kona. My parents <laughs> called me that. So I introduced myself as Kona. Um, from there, it depends probably which setting I'm in. I'd, if it's more formal, I'd say at this moment I have the privilege of running a managing a program in a nonprofit on the North Shore of Oahu called the Kokua Hawaii Foundation um, that works in schools and communities and businesses to promote environmental education. If it's a less formal setting, I'd probably say that I'm curious and competitive person trying to be as compassionate as possible while learning about the best ways to promote human flourishing. That's what I'm I coming that, to find. I think it's a I'm solid. trying to figure that one out, though. That's the question I'm living. That's a I'd solid say. intro. That's a solid it? question to ask. Yeah. And, right. I th- and I would say that we are somewhere in between formal and informal in this setting. I mean, mm-hmm. we're not too formal, but we do have fancy microphones. Exactly. So. We have a DJ <laughs> booth in front of us with the sounds. <laughs> I also uh, listened to a few podcasts, so I had a feeling this question was going to come up. So uh, this is the most um, thought out of the answers. It's your prepared answer. <laughs> which probably may be, make it the worst. <laughs> um, all good, man. So, but you're you're from the North Shore, Oahu, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and let's assume that most people know that that's an amazing place with lots of waves. Yeah. But tell me about the environment of that spot. Tell, tell, tell our listeners around the world, you know, what's that place like in terms of its natural environment and ecosystem? Yeah, that's a good question. The growing up in a place, it's funny for me, 
I mean, obviously, when you have never left a place, you only know that place. Totally. So you have no perspective outside. And the feelings that I got growing up were just uh, a lot of joy from playing. It's a natural playground. Seven-mile stretch on the north coast of Oahu that's just filled with beaches and waves. So I felt super lucky to be playing at the beach and surfing, especially gained perspective when I moved over to California um, on just the joy that came from the environment there. And then I think later down the line, you start to think about the elements that go into making a playful environment that kind of creates awe on a day-to-day basis, I'd say. And um, yeah, you realize that it's it's a rural place, even though Oahu's had um, a good amount of development. Honolulu is more or less the city. Yeah. Um, I think the North Shore has stayed relatively intact as far as a lot of fauna, not so many buildings around. You have the beaches, but you also have this big mountainscape behind you. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's funny that, yeah, so those little things, even coming back and then having friends come over, and the first thing they'll look back and be like, wow, that mountain range right behind you. And there's this beautiful mountain ridge, just only green. And like, like I look up, oh yeah, I forget, you kind of like... <laughs> My backyard. Normalizes, but it's, um, yeah, it's special, I think, because of the, yeah, the combination of the amount of fauna, the strong strength of community there. Everyone tends to know each other. It's a pretty small area. Uh, connected by surfing, as you talked about. A lot of people know it, especially in the surf world, is and the mecca of surfing. For so sure. Growing up, um, you would see surfers from around the world coming in and coming to compete and surf. And yeah, it's another aspect you don't realize until you leave that there's not many places in the world that have that many waves jam-packed into seven miles of beach. It's insane. World quality waves. Yeah. 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 World class waves all over the place and this incredible backdrop and setting. It's no Mm -hmm. wonder it's known as Mecca for surfing. Yeah. Um, But it is like, like you kind of teed up, it is an incredible ecosystem. Um, I was really fortunate to just recently be on Maui and like, man, that place is stunning. And just Mm. you have this incredible, you know, sort of. These, these are mountain ranges that stick up out of the ocean, in the mm-hmm. middle of the ocean. It's just really unique biodiversity, um, which is super cool. But we're here today to talk not just about Hawaii, but also about a recent trip you took and to another island and that experience. And so how did this thing come together? I mean, you all just sort of started sailing on the North Shore or, or what? How did this trip formulate? Yeah, so I my grandfather was a sailor. So I think that for myself, it was... Uh, I was around boats when I was younger, so I was lucky to have some small boats around the house. And um, so in the summers, a few friends, we'd go out and we'd sail. And just a few years back, we uh, began sailing a bit more and working up to a, a larger trip. Yeah, that's awesome. And so so it was like literally, I think you mentioned before, it was like a sunfish, and then you progressed into bigger and bigger boats. Yeah, so we started in just a small mono hole, a single sail, a sunfish. That's what I had under under my house. Yeah, and then um, yeah, it's it's a really fun boat. It's pretty slow, just like really Cruzy. easy to sail. And um, yeah, because you've you've done some sailing. Yeah, too, for right? sure. Yeah, you started on on the longboard and you progressed yeah, yeah. down to the performance sailing. I guess right. Yeah, S- same thing as surfing. Pretty much, I'd, I'd say. Did you start on similar? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I sailed, uh, sunfish and some other random little boats that, yeah. you know, do well in near shore, but eventually as you go offshore, you want to work up to your catamarans and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. But, um, so with, with this, who's in the crew? You kind of say we, a bunch of friends who, who's, mm-hmm. who's this tight crew that started thinking about this? Yeah. So the, the trip came together eventually it was, it was myself, um, and just a few good friends that I grew up on the North shore with, um, who also happened to be some of the best surfers in the world, super lucky, and connected to the WSLs as John John, who competes on the tour. 2X world champ, for those who don't know. He's a world champion. Yeah. One of the best surfers that, yeah, I know, obviously, great <laughs> surfer. Uh, Nathan Florence, his younger brother, who's another big amazing wave, surfer. charger, yeah. like, awesome. Uh, and then we have Eric Knutson, who is just a close friend of ours and goes around and films John and kind of films the adventures that they're getting on. Waterman and cinematographer. Waterman cinematographer. Yeah. And um, 
And then we had one expert sailor. So we've been progressing. <laughs> so you brought sailing. in a little bit of gray hair. Yes. We, um, yeah. Even though we started five years ago, we were on the sunfish. And we had quite a bit of progression to that point. Uh, we definitely still had to seek mentorship for a, a longer crossing, which yeah. is what we began to build up to each of the summers we were sailing and having fun and just realizing that we can get to these distant places, starting with the outer islands. Yeah. So, okay. So what was this longer crossing? Where'd you go? Yeah. So we ended up going to Palmyra Atoll. And where is that? And that is a small atoll. I didn't know about it before we went. Um, <laughs> A thousand miles south of Oahu. How many days sailing is that supposed to be? Which yeah. I, I say supposed to be because you never know what the wind is going to do and all that. Mm -hmm. But so it depends it, which boat that you're going. Of course. And um, we were lucky. We John is able. He has a, a catamaran. So that progression of sail. It stops with me at the Sunfish under my house, <laughs> <laughs> and then as Eric talks about, the best boat is your friend's boat. <laughs> so <laughs> luckily, um, yeah, John's passion and just kind of technical mind continued to build and we went to smaller catamarans and then he now has a, a larger cat and using that, it it goes quicker than a lot of boats and is relatively stable. So that's nice because I think that average cruising, if you're on a mono hull, is maybe like four knots or mm -hmm. five knots. I don't know in your experience if it's been similar. We've done better and we've done worse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so we've we've had both because we actually initially we had this um, before John's larger cat. As the boats got bigger, there was a, a large mono hull that was thirty five feet long, a J thirty five it's called. So just the single hull, and that was pretty slow and rocky. So anyway, with with that boat, yeah. So how many days going was it supposed over? To take? It would it would take maybe. 20 or so with this catamaran it was predicted to take about eight eight days with, so, but this is with the forecasted wind so sure. maybe if there's optimal wind it can go down to like six and a half but still that's a, that's a that's a long sail out to sea eight yes. days at sea is a long sail i've i've sailed and done like 10 days and that that gets long after a while but eight days at sea is long enough <laughs> mm -hmm. And so why were you sailing there? Like, was it just to test your limits of your sailing or was there a greater purpose for getting to this destination? Yeah, I think a combination of both, which is like um, we, in the progression of the craft of sailing, I'd say it's just fun to, to begin to build confidence and go to further distances. For sure. So whether that was going to Lanai, these outer islands and going a little further, think naturally you look for the next place that you can go to uh, and then it just happened that it, it's like a perfect storm where you can do that but then at the same time it's like where are you going to be going so you have to have the tools to get there and the know-how which itself is a rewarding part of the process and then the case of this trip the initial impetus, impetus was actually um, to go to Tahiti so for the competition for the competition for so, the world championship tour stop. yeah okay so be a cool John, way to rock up to a tour stop it would yeah. paddle and, in straight from the boat don't even you yeah. know check in at the judges tower just <laughs> and i wish i could claim these ideas as my own <laughs> guiding john john just i think we should sail it's like okay but yeah he just has these cool ideas and he so john was he was going and he decided that would be a fun way to get somewhere and just have a little break between the events for sure uh, so that was a, original was it would be a fun way to get somewhere and then in that process you wouldn't have to be flying so you wouldn't have to be burning carbon to get to a place you have to be so for his job he's traveling around the world has the fortune of doing these surfing contests around the world and um, so I think it was just it was all around going to be fun for him and better for the environment yeah. which was this kind of you know, which is always there when you're sailing and just this, this idea that you have to be there only through wind. Yeah. So that, those were original concepts with the trip, I'd say, and stemming from just John thinking it up and then he got injured. So he couldn't compete in the tour anymore. Yeah. 
And of course, as we talked about before, these trips take a long time to plan. Yeah, you got to have the right window. Everyone has to be window, available. Exactly. You need the weather window. You need all the crew and all that stuff. Yeah. So I remember talking to some of the crew about this and it was like, oh, we're going to do this thing. We want to make it about sustainability and like try and you know go as low impact as we can. And then he got hurt. And I was like, ah, bummer. But it sounds mm -hmm. like you still pulled off a similar trip to the Palmyra Atoll. And so why mm -hmm. is that place special? What is special about that, that unique environment? Yeah, so Palmyra, just to answer the question, it was it ended up being Palmyra because once it got pulled, my selfish view was like, are we going to sail at all? And then, of course, we uh, we still wanted to go, and it was a perfect thing for John to do, too, with the knee. So Palmyra came up because it was close by. John had heard about it as well. And as soon as we saw that, it just made so much sense to go because it was already in the vicinity of where we were thinking. And then it was just this amazing story where it's this island, a small atoll that uh, for the last 30 years has been under conservation with the Nature Conservancy. Right. So it's relatively protected then. Exactly. From... We're protected. And um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife actually has you have to get a permit to go in. So it. So as soon as we start researching, it's just this small oasis that has been called by a lot of people a potential hope spot for the world because it provides a baseline for what atolls could look like without any human um, interaction. Yeah, and we don't really have that in a lot of places as a society, right? Because we've, we've touched and impacted so many environments that we don't actually know what is a really healthy coral reef supposed to look like? Or what does a healthy shoreline look like when there are no human impacts? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some of these places, but there aren't a ton of them left. And so the Hope Spot program from, I believe it's Mission Blue, uh, is trying to say, all right, what are the places that we need to protect and still have hope of creating biodiversity, right? And, and how do we show this off to the world and say, look, this is what it can look like? Because if you don't have that baseline, then you can't really understand what's going on with human impacts back on Oahu or anywhere else, right? Yeah, exactly. And and you have the fortune as well of traveling all around, which is rad. I'd like to hear the, the places that you get to go with the tour and see, and a lot of times these populated areas, as we all have the as surfers, this experience of doing, and I've had the experience of traveling so it was a unique opportunity, and I, I misspoke a bit when I said no human impact. Kind right. of the most exciting thing about it, as we found more when we went down there, is that it's just a very um, conscious and selective impact that happens. So it's a small population there. But the idea... About how many people? There's just, it's a, yeah, 15 people live at the camp. Okay. That, I'd say that's t a tiny population. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Small. Okay. <laughs> Smaller yeah, than say. small. But Coming from the North Shore. So, uh, but they're basically, yeah. they're scientists. Yeah. I mean, it's essentially a science and conservation crew trying to study and understand it. It's not like people are yeah, living exactly. there. So it's not some guy's yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very selected population of yeah. experts. So yeah, it's, it's just like the, uh, the nature conservancy has set up a station and it's, it's all research, more or less. So there's yeah. primarily scientists on the island. And then there's people maintaining as well. Yeah. And talk to me about the environment itself. I mean, did you get to snorkel the reef? Did you get to go hike on land? Like, what is it? Is it was it life changing in that experience of that natural environment that has no real human impact there? Yeah, I, I think that the trip itself, I mean, it's always hard when you cue something up as life changing. <laughs> sorry, it, sorry. Is that too heavy? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that going in that you have like a month long sailing trip planned to somewhere in this um, area in the middle of nowhere. I kind of hoped that it would be, or you assume that it is. Yeah. I mean, sailing long distances in and of itself is pretty life changing or it can mm -hmm. be pretty profound. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had some of my most uh, you know impactful moments out on a sailboat in the open ocean at night under the stars with phosphorescence trailing behind under sail. It's just like you're on a magic carpet through space and you're just kind of like, wow, I am deep out here in the middle of the wild ocean and it's really powerful. And I, I like, I still hearken back to that sailing trip and think it's so cool. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is amazing. You're doing that and then you're touching down in this pristine ecosystem. And I, that's why I guess my totally. hope or ex expectation is that it would be oh, yeah. sort of life changing. Yeah, and I, I guess I just say that to diffuse this kind of, a lot of people use the term, but in this in this uh, way, I think it really was. And I just, yeah, the beginning of that, I even, one of our first conversations, part of that, the beauty of being out and detaching a bit, and this is just kind of through the process of the sale that's 
um, besides any ecosystems that are visited, is you kind of different questions start coming up and you feel a little more space outside of the day-to-day -day momentum. And one of the questions I think that came up in the beginning was if you had a billion dollars or so, which I recently, is an aside, but the, a million seconds, do you know how, how much time a million seconds equates to? No. It's 11 days. Yeah, I was going to say. And how much time do you think a billion seconds equates to? Well, so it's some hundreds of hundreds of days. I'm terrible at math. No, yeah, and this this isn't a trap is question. I'm sorry. Like that's the that's my intuition as yeah. well. A billion seconds is 32 years. 32 years. Wow. Yes, which is crazy. So, an aside on wealth, it, we so it's hard to even conceptualize that kind of wealth. But one of the first questions that came up was, "You have a billion dollars, so vastly more than any millions. Uh huh. Um, what would you be doing? Yeah." Which is just fun to, you know, the taking a step back. And sure. What would you do with the money or what would you personally be doing? What like, would you be doing you at saying, this moment? Like, would you conserve this place? Oh, well, just like what would you be doing with your life at this right. moment? Where would you be work would you be working? What would, if you didn't have to work? This kind of it's kind of the fun discussion depends, that comes up on the boat. Depends how you define work, right? Exactly. You know, yeah, like exactly. Working for someone to get a paycheck is one thing. Mm -hmm. Working to make change. Yeah, or what kind of work what, would you be doing? Right. So that's like the good work I like to say. Yeah, exactly. But um but anyway, I just felt very lucky because, you know, in a way, the, the trip I'm going to talk about is um, it was being filmed by Eric. So I'd like to think of it, you know, as like the luckiest kind of a somewhat work because hopefully it becomes a project that that we can talk about, yeah. which it is becoming. Yeah. But, so um, it's going to be on. It's going to be on. It's in partnership with Outside TV, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. it's going to be on air uh, in April. Yeah, so mid-April will be coming out, partnered with, so it's on out, all outside TV platforms, as well as John's YouTube channel. Cool. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it was a, a type of work, even though I was very lucky to be out there. And um, and yeah, I just was reflecting on that question. And at this point, I was thinking, I, you know, mid-20s, I'd really just probably have like a suitcase. I knew that I was financially set, the family was okay, I'd love to be traveling around this world and and understanding different places to ultimately come back to my place right. and understand that place more. And then, you know, that's maybe a little more articulate than I had it back then, but, <laughs> but it, I found myself doing that on this boat. So, so in that way it was like, wow, this is kind of this life changing or moment of, uh, a powerful moment that you talk about when you're out there. Yeah. So it, that leading into Palmyra, the life changing thing with actually touching the ecosystem. Yeah. I'd say it was just you went from that feeling of openness on the boat, but this is all romanticized a bit too, as you'll probably see in the series. I haven't watched it, but I've heard uh, <laughs> I make a good seasick character for at least one of the episodes. <laughs> every every sailing episode, every sailing show needs one. Oh, yeah. I've been that guy too. You're yeah. Good. From the beginning, I've kind of been the, I was like, this is the best thing ever. But the seasickness is the uh, worst. It's, it's Luckily, brutal. it's only on day one. Yeah. And you need a little uncomfortableness. But yeah. anyway, so that's, so there is a little uncomfortableness on the way over. But when but we, then you, you get there and yeah, like, we well, get talking there about the environment. Yes. I'll get to the environment. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's I'm beautiful. so eager. No, it's, it, it really, I mean, it, yeah. So you get there and it, it had been built up in our minds too, because we'd only researched this place and what does a hope spot, you know, like how we're coming from Oahu, which as I, said in the beginning, it was also a bit of a romanticized version. There's a lot of problems there, which mm -hmm. we can talk about as well, but more or less compared to most places, we're so privileged to have beauty, the mountain ridge. So we're wondering if, you know, if it would just be similar. And being an atoll was different, but when we first glide in, it's just, yeah, we were just screaming with excitement. And I think uh, John was the first person here, like a land ho. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> After we may have been a slightly deranged at that point, just like collecting water every time that rained, and but the colors there. After especially not seeing anything, so right. for seven days, like you were saying, that was a long sail, and and that alone was just interesting to be out there and kind of being like, oh wow, is this going to be a lot of organisms? And we started saying it was more of a desert because we only saw a few and mostly just the blue, which has its beauty in itself, the stars. Yeah. But then getting in contact again with this ecosystem, it was just the thing that stuck out was just these um, 
the greens and the white, you know, just the basic colors when you're coming in. It felt very pristine. These small um, coral reefs, you could kind of see reflecting from down below, but it, just the exterior was enough to like really take your breath away. And then once we got in, you're kind of coming in, it's like a crescent shaped atoll. You're coming in this um, a channel and then the first forms of life, well, actually, I suppose the first forms of life were more of like a mile out or so. Mm-hmm. And it goes from this desert of ocean that we were at to just tornadoes of birds all around. Totally. And just the fish. So like once you get in there, the island itself just became more or less like this giant tornado of birds just screeching, which um, is especially rare in Oahu. We don't have so many native birds anymore. Yeah, it's funny. One time uh, recently, Kahi um, took a photo of a seagull, and I guess there was a seagull on Oahu, and he, he said, you don't really have them there, I guess. Mm. And he was like, go back to the mainland, blah, blah, blah kind of like talking <laughs> trash about the gull. I was like, bro, like leave the gull alone. Everyone He's calling hates the that. seagull a howley? <laughs> <laughs> Kahi. And, and, and I was like, dude, like they're not so bad, you know? Yeah. They're an important part of an ecosystem, and yeah. everyone thinks they're just like rats of the sky. But, yeah. you know, seabirds are a very important part of ecosystems and of, and of that ecosystem mm-hmm. i mean without the way that they are an element of um you know their feces is a part of providing nutrients to mm-hmm. the the ecosystem in underwater and mm-hmm. there's a whole cycle there um so yeah i don't know don't hate on gulls yeah or seabirds i like seabirds sheer waters are incredible I like it but i'm gonna say um don't hate on the fish either no definitely not no that that was the one funny thing uh, one of the people actually on palmyra who we learned was they in general, a lot of people were in favor of, um, they could only catch a few fish. I mean, this is actually a hot topic on the island. Oh, but, interesting. But the, so whether to fish more because we're part of the ecosystem or to not fish. But anyway, I just bring it up because one of them was like, you don't catch birds every day. So in that sense, they're almost, was, we're a little more revered than the fish down below. Oh, wow. We're not catching those. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, that was what we eventually learned was the beauty, you know, When we're first getting there, we all are coming in more or less surfers who've grown up on the North Shore. But I think, you know, we all have a passion for the craft of surfing. We all have family connections, friends, and um, slightly different. Like, I went the college route, so, you know, I have some kind of basic education, but wasn't in science. And um, John and Nathan were both some of the most intelligent people I know, and they didn't go to school at all. Right. Which... Is just blows my mind also and really impressive. So it was cool. But so for them, I think we both had a, a general idea. We've been in our place for so long on the North Shore and out in the, you know, as most people are surfing. So we get a sense of what's going on, but it don't have like the a technical understanding. So did you learn that in, in your trip? Did you get some of the technical expertise yeah. and understanding? Yeah. So that was, I think some of the hope was to clear, because we all have our opinions, I'd say going in and and it's not that we don't have certain, you know, we have like general ideas of reefs are going away, acidification is occurring, temperatures right. are rising, all these basic guidelines, but not so much of like getting into the details of like, but what's a healthy ecosystem look, or like what is an ecosystem that sequesters carbon right. to begin battling some of these bigger topics that that we all hear about a lot. Yeah. And, and yeah, that... Connected to the birds was one important one on Palmyra. So just to connect from us getting there, just the experience alone was life-changing in a way, just experiencing a place that was very raw. And you felt like a different, even though you're still in the Pacific. And then going in and seeing that these whirlwinds of birds that are above you and you're flying in, just as you were saying, the cycle of them pooping on all of these native trees. Right. And then when every time it would rain, it would go under. It's just feeding nutrients. And in a lot of ways, it's so complex. You talking to these scientists, and even there, they're just trying to fill in the gaps, from my understanding. Yeah, they still have questions and gaps in their knowledge. But then the cool thing is you can start to capture the consequences. Or in that case, in Palmyra, what we learned is is that you can look up Stuart Sandin, who is um, a researcher out of Scripps. He's okay. He um, leads a lab and he looks at coral reefs. And him and his wife were down there. We we're really lucky to meet up with them. And they have um, an initiative called the Hundred Islands Initiative. Okay. Where they're mapping the bottom 
of islands across the world. Whoa. So, and the, they're some of the most, seem to me, technically proficient coral scientists. And they are just saying, we just need that baseline. We need to see what's happening. And then I imagine there's people working on all aspects yeah. going down. But in Palmyra, the really cool thing was that their imagery, which you can look at online, shows that the reefs went through a coral bleaching event that we all heard about in around 2014, 2015. Right. Where in a lot of places, to my knowledge, 90% of coral reefs were bleached. And uh, Stuart, who goes around the world documenting these changes, said that Palmyra is one of the few places where we now see 100% recovery. That's incredible. In coral reefs. So we have that narrative of acidification and the bleaching. Right. And that's important. But it also is saying these, it's important to see these places where the reefs are actually coming back and there's a resilience there and that resilience is connected to these variables that are within that ecosystem that cycle that you talked right. about and i think a lot of them are still being parsed out it yeah. seems there's still a lot we don't know and that's the importance of science and the importance of going around and studying these places where we don't have human impacts because it's hard to pin down the variables in a place like oahu where you have lots of people getting in and so is it you know, climate change and acidification, ocean warming? Is it um, sunscreen, you know, uh, affecting the reefs in some way? Is it runoff and nutrient runoff from from land uses and all that stuff? So there's a lot going on. It's very hard to understand. Whereas if you get to these pristine places, if we have a few places just protected <laughs> so we can study them and understand and also to just serve as a place to um, uh, for the ocean to rebound and for species to rebound, then that's a really, really important thing. So now coming back to... Oahu, you know, is your is your outlook changed? Are you how are you viewing you know your home island now uh, after this experience, and how is that impacting the things that you're doing? Yeah, so it's definitely changed. I think that's been in the process of changing since um, I mentioned going away to school and then graduating from university and kind of being a process of re- realizing school is this environment, so to speak, this ecosystem where you have the end goal. And then once you're done, you kind of have to create the new ecosystem around you and what kind of healthy ecosystem that would be, both a psychological and like a physical front. Okay. And um, so I'd say it's part of that process. The sales fits in. And um, going back to Oahu, what I'd been kind of thinking about before the sale, which was helpful in going there, is just this idea you're saying of what is the cycles around you that are... um, creating degradation yeah what systems are at work what systems are at work and i i didn't talk earlier but the the things about the north shore that were beautiful were also some of the things that growing up i also i think because we all have it we all have the development in our backyards but especially in places where there are so little and then to a lot more i think it it was a little more impactful. So I was always thinking like, what are these systems that are at work, even unconsciously before of just like, why is traffic 20 times worse on this two lane <laughs> road in this North rural shore town traffic. of the North Shore of Oahu? Or, Infamous. Yeah. Or, and having a strong community around like, we don't want five hotels here. And it's like, why, like one, why is, why are hotels coming up? And then why are people coming in and are excited about this place? So I think that that, that thinking has been there. And then in school, I kind of, I meandered a bit, but it was ultimately looking at like, the political and economic, which realized just scrapping the surface there, it's um, a whole other equation. But that ultimately it seemed like there was this idea that I like this author, Wendell Berry, a lot, who's from Kentucky. It's mostly I try and just repeat what other people who are wise <laughs> say. And uh, he, yeah, I was yelled at at school that if there's one thing by Carlo Petrini of Slow Foods Movement. He says, if there's one thing all Americans should do, it's go read Wendell Berry. And it okay. took me many years to start reading. But on this trip, I actually did, which is funny. And oh, wow. He has this book. It was on the boat by chance as oh, well. Oh, that's so funny. The f- previous owner had left a few books. What's the name of the book? The Art of the Commonplace okay. by what's, Wendell Berry. And what's the quote that you're about to tee up? Yeah, so the quote is uh, just about how the economy subsumes the ecology at present, meaning that we... He points out as like a small farmer in Kentucky that a lot of the changes he sees on small farms 
nationwide, which is an ecosystem in themselves, is, is a lot driven by not only profits, but just kind of economic exchange and arrangement. It's a whole other deal. But that, in his view, like an effective farm and a productive farm is thinking about the ecology and then the ecology of the place drives the economy. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the more abstract idea that I'd probably been mulling over and but concretely but you're concretely actually working I'm actually, on a farm. <laughs> yeah, there is a farm back on Oahu that I'm so I get on this sailing trip and the art of the commonplace is there and I'm reading Wendell Berry that my first year in college I was yelled at to read <laughs> and um and yeah, a lot of it's just about the ecology of places and once you can only know a place if you are there and only by knowing a place do you love the place is his kind of what he talks about. And yeah. then and only in loving the place do you protect it. Um, I think that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. Yes. So it sounds like that's the work that you're doing now with Kakua Hawaii and, um, you know, uh, Zero Waste Oahu, Surf Riders, Sustainable Coastlines. Like you've been a part of so many of these movements to now protect the place, whether it's Bill 40 or the farm that you're creating with Kakua. Yeah, I feel lucky. I'd say it was a coalition of people that I fell back into when I went back home from school. And now I'm just playing a small part in trying to understand the ecosystem of the North Shore. But it's, yeah, recently with Kokua Hawaii, it's, um, I know that my aunt actually, Kim Johnson, was on the podcast before. She was. You can go get a little background on the Kokua. But yeah, we've, we've purchased a farm, luckily. So it's kind of these farm to school programs that are happening gardens they've created this curriculum and now there's a place for it um and that's the growing the learning farm and yeah there's legislation in the works and you talked to rafael bergstrom yep who, sustainable coastlines yeah who's another inspiration for me get to see him back on oahu he was huge in getting the legislative work because the farm as i see it's kind of you have people that care about the place. You have the grassroots, which is important on the bottom. But then ultimately, you need to go top down, which is the legislative work. So, yeah, recently Bill 40 passed, which is banning single use. Super exciting. Yeah, and, and I know that Raphael works with the WSL and doing waste diversion. Yep, and they do a fantastic really job cool. for the whole Vans Triple Crown series. They do awesome, awesome work. Yeah, and now uh, the learning farm going up, it's exciting because I think that Kim had talked about it was just beginning and we're just a couple of months down the line. Yeah. And um, yeah, we have a composting facility that's going up. So hopefully the cups that are going to the WSL events will end up in the composter. That's in partnership with Raphael and Sustainable Coastlines. Um, so that place is starting up. And the cool thing was that was just in, in the works a bit when before I was leaving on the sailing trip. And, um, and then in going there, that the idea of ecology first is like I think part of the problem is that we kind of have this sense for you know and I'm not going to dispute economic paradigms I think that like (laughs) who knows the conversation there are small tweaks that can be made it's not like a all or nothing conversation or that like capitalist needs to go capitalism needs to go down I think that just markets aren't built for everything and that certain ones have to be regulated in a way yeah for sure so and I think that the difficulty is that understanding ecology is labor intensive and hard and you need people on the ground to do that to even begin to have the seedlings for the policy and then of course if the policy is there the farm bill for example yeah a lot of people say it should be 300 years because any farm is thinking in those time frames Mm -hmm. but it's just hard in the climate it sounds it sounds like you're talking about like a greater connection in overall overall to the environment to our land to help mm -hmm. inform our policies because it feels like maybe overall if if i can zoom out and try and distill what you're saying it's like we've grown so disconnected from our natural land and our place and our community that we're designing policies without keeping that in mind is that kind of a fair yeah summary i think that's a very concise summary (laughs) reese you must be a professional (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that ultimately would be a good way, you know, of describing the value and life-changing effect of the sailing trip, which is that, because um, like we were all surfers and we're all like in this small strata that live on the beach more or less. So you'd assume we are the people, like I am the connected one, you know, or so. Right. They say, but it's like, I feel, I, you know, we're disconnected there as well. It's just part of like the makeup of a lot of the, you know, like uh, how we're functioning and 
It's just the way society is moving. It's yeah, just it's pushing us move. further and further I, like, into screens and away from exactly being our outdoors. awareness. Yeah. So media, the and so I think we're lucky to be outdoors. And then this trip was even just like an, a further reminder of like, wow, even when I'm back home, you know, it's like we're in the water, but then just as easily it can be in a city and be a lot more connected than someone on the coast because it can be on the coast, but then be back on your phone. Yeah. I'm guilty of yeah. trying to meditate more. Being in cities, you can also be connected more to your people. So just yeah, you don't exactly, have to live people. in a natural place to be connected to your community. Your community totally. is what you make of it. And, you know, like I lived in New York City for 10 years and Rockaway Beach specifically. So, yeah, we had a connection to the ocean. But it was really that amazing connection to people that we felt. And that creates that community so that you can all work together towards better solutions. Yeah. At least. Our- cool. Anything else you want to share with us? Uh, no, I think that it would just end on that note, which is, yeah, thanks for the interview, Reese. And that I, I suppose part of that um, ecology and economy abstract thought that I threw out, which, <laughs> you know, is like for me, part of that process, understanding, you know, like being a part of the system, understanding the uh, connections around you, whether it's the city you're talking about or the place that I know and just place-based learning in general. And that for me, the latest path has been thinking about the people that represent you, which is ultimately the culture that we're creating in a democratic society. So, yeah, I just, I don't know, would encourage people, whatever they're feeling in this this next election, to research and go out and vote. But not only start there, but, and this is just me trying to do the same at the same time, but learn about your the local politics. Yeah, I think Bill connected. 40 was, yeah, you just get connected in, in those ways and it takes a lot of time and, you know, I'm in the water a lot and playing around, but it's actually, I, I enjoy it a lot and it was really nice to see a bill, like Bill 40 passed. It's nice to have a win. You don't always it's get huge those win. wins. Yeah. I think Raphael said it was seven years totally. that he's been working on it and he hasn't, you know, it's been years and years before that. I was like the lucky millennial that came in and was like, you know, I'd, I'd known and always been connected with Plastic Free Hawaii, sure. but, you know, it was in my own world until like thinking like, oh, maybe I can go and just see some of the and give some feedback to my local council member on Oahu. And then, yeah, just uh, so I was lucky one out of one for that one. But I know there's a lot of fights and in Hawaii, there's a few bills for composting wherever you are. So I think that getting engaged that way is a fun way to get connected yeah. and just or just finding like minded people. But a good way to probably start is the election in 2020. It's, it's a great one. It's one of many opportunities to be engaged, like you're saying. I mean, I a recent win is New York City finally passed the ban on plastic bags and it went into effect. And you look at Australia and the fight for the bite and the way the community stepped up to speak out. And so there are a number of these different things, whatever the issue is. I mean, at the end of the day, get connected to the issue. And that issue is connected to a lot of other issues. And so politics is one part of that. But the more connected we are, the more we understand each other, the better we can all be together, hopefully. Yeah. And that's the art of the commonplace. Wendell Berry. All right. I got to read it. You get the, yeah, that's the good work. And ultimately, you know, I suppose we're seeking fulfillment and no better way to be fulfilled than banding together with people that you play around with in the ocean or on the land and trying to get something done that affects the people around you. Beautifully said, man. Can I ask you a few questions then, oh, Reese sure. Pacheco? Oh, right. Sure. Yeah. We turn it around now. Yeah. And thanks to the work that you guys do on the North Shore, too. Since you've been on, especially, it's been fun to see this podcast grow also Thanks, going man. in <laughs> seeing like uh some community members on there we have jamie gove who helped yeah. the palmyra adventure uh scientist but yeah so i have this first question is from okay my sister who's jacqueline johnson and she works at a company that you know bureo yep and she's wondering what the plans are for this year for the wsl pier and what any activations are looking like on the ground. Oh, interesting. Um, for the whole year or specifically North Shore? Uh, I'd say just for the year in for the general. Year. Yeah. The big one for us is uh, we have a campaign we're working on around 30 by 30, which is the uh, UN target that's being proposed by countries and nonprofits and governments, which is to protect 30% of our marine and terrestrial areas by 2030. If we don't conserve that space, we're putting the planet in peril. If we do, we give ourselves a very good chance to preserve biodiversity 
and um, enable fisheries to recover, enable uh, habitat to store carbon, enable us to uh, you know, better adapt to climate change. And so this is a really important target that's going to be decided at the UN Convention on Biodiversity in October in China. And so we're working to uh, rally the surf community to support it. Um, it's, it's well known in conservation circles, but it's not known in the public sphere. And so we want to do our part to raise awareness and rally our community of friends and, and, and supporters and nonprofits and other sports around the ocean to say, hey, we want this and to speak out to your you know, local electeds and to um, you know, government officials and basically tell the UN, we want this, set, set high targets, set 30 by 30. Some scientists have called for 50% protected. Um, but 30% is the goal. Currently, we only have about 4.8% protected globally. And only 2.2% of that is highly protected, uh, which means no take zones, etc. So we have a long way to go. But it's certainly possible. Um, it's about that political willpower and, you know, getting out there, especially in the open ocean. As you know, you sailed in the open ocean. Uh, it is fairly lawless out there. Um, you beyond the exclusive economic zones of a lot of nations, uh, there's just kind of, you know, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so how do we protect those areas and make them resilient for all the change that the earth is rapidly going through? So that's, that's the big one. You're going to see that come to life across different tour stops, um, digitally in a number of ways. Uh, we're working with some surfers on a couple projects, so it, it should be a fun one. Oh man. Yeah. I'd like to let me know if I can help with that offline. And You're also, in. Yeah. And also, um. Yeah, even on Palmyra, just behind the island, they're like, there's fishing ships out here all the time that we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Um, Good there question. you go, Jacqueline. Cool. Thanks for the Thanks, question. Jacqueline. And then the last one's just from me, which is, um, yeah, inspired by the way you hold conversation, how we started just giving people space. I think that's the best in the environmental world or that I'm trying to learn is to give people more space to create that community. So what are those practices that help you do that or help you stay connected as we were talking about earlier? To the environmental community or in general or? Or that allow you to, yeah, conduct yourself in a way that is connected. Gotcha. Um, well, as a human being, uh, I am, I operate much better when I've had some adrenaline, some exercise and some fun and when I'm fed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sleep, eating healthy and making sure I get exercise. And that puts me in a much better mood. My endorphins are, are going. So, um, I, it's hard cause we all are working so hard. And with this work, it is, it's not just my job here. It is what I care about deeply. And so I often feel like I can't ever give enough time to this, but I also know that if I just grind in front of a computer for hours on end, 14 hour days or whatever, then eventually I just become a grumpy boy. And so, um, I do have to work to make time, um, to, for myself, get out and exercise, sleep, eat, whatever. Um, but also I read a lot, making sure I'm hearing opinions from different places. Cause I realize that I see the world through my perspective and that's an American perspective, you know, um, and that's a male perspective, uh, tall white male specifically, you know, like, so I really try to make sure that I'm reading different opinions, uh, you know, so social media for better or worse provides that. Um, and I'm able to find different opinions. So I'm kind of like round trying to round out my perspective while knowing that I still have tons of gaps. Um, and then I try really hard to make sure that, you know, when we're working on a project, we create a team that's at least, you know, different voices within the WSL or make sure we bring in our coalition partners and have them be heard and try to just like we talked about, make space for people to speak. You know, it's very easy to go into a meeting, be the loudest voice in the room and be like, cool, great. That was a great meeting. And you did all the talking. Um, you have to make space for other people to speak. And so that's kind of psychological safety. And we talked a lot about this in the episode with Leith Sharp from Harvard, uh, whose course I took. You create that sort of psychological safety of, hey, we're all in this together. We're all on a team. Now let's figure out how to engage and work together and make sure you hear those voices. Um, and then like the final one is just you know, my wife, Annie is just awesome. She's fantastic. You know, I think it's maybe a little cliche to shout out the partner, but shout out Annie. <laughs> she, she's particularly great and she's really, she balances and counteracts me kind of counterbalances me in a number of ways. Um, she kind of keeps me, she's a very even keel and just really will challenge my, my thinking. And I think that's really healthy. Um, cause otherwise, you know, if I get too myopic and like, I'm going to go do this thing, you know, she's like, well, have you thought about this? And 
sometimes I'm like, you're supposed to be on my side no matter what. And she's like, well, I'm on your side, but I'm trying, you know, she's looking out for me. So it's a really healthy balance. So I, I think those are some of the, the major ones that stick out for me. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, that's good. All right. Appreciate spending the time. If anyone wants to, is on Oahu, the learning farm currently first Saturdays of every month. We're trying to create that ecosystem, very open to all suggestions. We have work days going on. We get in the soil and just Super start cool. uh, building the community and community workshops are coming. Former guest Ethan Estes is coming out in nice. April for art shows and hopefully have a hub. And yeah, looking forward to hosting you guys when you come back to the North Shore at some point. I can't wait, man. Okay. Thanks, thanks for Connor. the work. Thanks, dude. If you haven't already, I really encourage you to listen to our other conversation about Palmyra with Chad Wiggins from The Nature Conservancy. Also, go watch the series Vela. The takeaway for me is that while nature is fragile, it's also incredibly resilient. If we give it a chance, nature can and will rebound, and Palmyra is evidence of that. So thanks to Kona for sharing his experience. Uh, Definitely go watch the series linked in the show notes here. And if you want to learn more about the Nature Conservancy, hit up nature.org slash Palmyra. Thank you for listening. If you like what we're up to here, please throw us a digital tip in the form of a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. It is massively appreciated. It helps the podcast grow and reach new people. We'll be back next week with another episode. In the meantime, be sure to follow along at WSL Pure on social networks or hit us up on email at oneocean at wslpure.org. Okay, until next week, aloha. Do you like that? Well, if so, subscribe over there and then watch more videos over there. And then tell us your favorite videos down there. It's a three-step process. Do them all now.